Welcome to Hear God Every Day. I'm your host, Sarah Witten. Get comfortable, open your heart, and let's talk about how we can be more sensitive to God's voice in our everyday life. Welcome back in to the Hear God Every Day podcast. Um, so typically I have a list of just things God has dropped into my heart um, for this show. And I'll ask God, you know, okay, what would you like to do today? Like, which one are we going to dive into? Um, it'll be just little words and things that I've gotten. And today, as I was having my morning coffee, um, God just kind of flipped the script and said, all right, this is what I want you to talk about today. So, um, we are going to talk about truth over trauma. Um, how, as we hear God and what he's saying, and as we are moving into kind of this next season, we are going to need to hear the truth over hearing the trauma. And I first want to lay it out that I'm not saying that trauma isn't true, that it's not real or, you know, that it's, it's over exaggerated because, um, you know, some of the things that we have to walk through in this life are, are so painful and so real and, um, are not things that we are made to just ignore. Um, but the hope that I'm wanting you to hear in this and the love and encouragement that God is wanting to communicate to you in this is saying to you that there is a truth that is hopeful, that is greater than what you're currently seeing if all that you are hearing from your past experiences or from your journey is the trauma. So before I kind of dive in, let's just pray and ask the Holy Spirit into this time. Um, Father God, we just thank you that you don't leave things unresolved, that if it's not good, it's not done. And we thank you that you only give good things, that you're not the source of evil. You're not the source of heartbreak. You're not the source of sin, um, God, but that even through these things, that you hold our hands through them, that you are able to work them for good, that you're able to actually turn around what the enemy meant to break us down and use it to strengthen us. And so we thank you for that. And we just, um, we pray for this week, God, this is just an especially deep and raw week, but it's because we are walking into something that is, um, just going to be the kind of next unfolding of our calling, the next level um, of what you have created us for. And so fixing our eyes on that hope, that joy set before us, God, help us to just be present and to sit with you um, through what you're wanting to do in us. Help us to ask those hard questions and to hear your answers, to hear that compassion, to hear um, that sympathy and um, that empathy, actually, because, you know, you experience it with us. You walk with us. Um, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, so just right there as I was praying, when I used the word empathy, um, this this thought flashed into my mind. You know, I feel like Holy Spirit just brought it back to mind. But um, Bill Johnson talks about how the Lord, when he sees us, is moved with compassion and not empathy. And, you know, because empathy, empathy, yes, he does have empathy for what we're going through because he has walked it and he does walk it with us. But more than that, like the next layer of that, the thing on top of that is God has compassion for us. And he was saying compassion elicits a bold response, like compassion elicits action. And so when God has compassion for you, which he does in everything that you're walking through, when he has compassion for you, his compassion causes him to act. Um, God is never just silent in and um, unacting in our times of uh, pain. And I think it's really healing and comforting to know that. Okay, so setting up for this, um, this is kind of a little prophetic segue, but um, I was sitting with the Lord and just kind of thinking about this time 
of year. You know, I kind of mentioned last podcast, I think it was about, you know, how it's just a time of transition. Like it's, it's Rosh Hashanah. So it's the Jewish new year, but then in our kind of modern day Gregorian calendar, we're a couple months away from our new year. And so it's like these, these transitions and they're very clearly delineated seasons. Um, you know, I love numbers. And so, uh, I was praying into the numbers for, um, both the Hebrew year and our next, uh, Gregorian calendar year. And the Hebrew year, um, you know, some of you who kind of follow this stuff will recognize this, but the Hebrew year is, um, 5783. And this corresponds in Strong's Concordance with the word er, it's a Hebrew word and it means to be exposed or bare. And it's only used once it's used in the book of Habakkuk in chapter three, verse nine. And Habakkuk is praying and he says, you speaking of God uncovered your bow. And that's that laid bare. You uncovered your bow. You prepared your bow. In other words, you called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. And it struck me <laughs> as I was looking this up. I just like, man, God just started like speaking to me because um, those words of being exposed and laid bare as an act of preparation are literally what I feel like I and so many people who um, are close to me who are kind of, you know, just walking with the Lord. And um, we've just been in this season of God is just laying us bare. He is, um, you know, uncovering these new levels, um, new levels of, of revelation, but also new levels of, um, of healing and of, of remembering or getting deeper in touch with um, our identities and who he created us to be and our callings and all of these things. And so it's a very vulnerable place. Um, but it's a, a preparatory place. And what's so beautiful about this is obviously, so, um, that Jewish new year comes first that just recently happened this past weekend, but then December 31st to January 1st. So when we cross over into the new year on the Gregorian calendar, the 2023, 2023 in Strong's Concordance correlates with, um, a Greek word that I, I'm not going to, uh, butcher and try to pronounce, but it means, uh, I supply, provide lavishly or furnish. And it's such a beautiful juxtaposition with the laying bare. I think about it almost like a house. It's like, you know, when you move everything out, and it's bare, then you're able to bring in and fully furnish. And um, there's like this newness and this preparation and it just goes together. And I feel like these next couple of months, what God is doing in us on an individual level, as well as a corporate level, is he is laying us bare in order to fully provide lavishly both the healing we need, the insight we need to the callings that we have and giving us everything that we need for those callings. So that's a little background on kind of the why of how this came about. But um, this morning when I was sitting with my coffee and just thinking about um, you know, what God has kind of walked me through recently. Like it's been, it's been hard. It's been a time of pressure. It's been time of kind of walking through all these old things that I didn't understand a lot of disappointments, um, just that I didn't understand, but then God has been giving me, um, just new words for them and new understanding about them. And, um, in that process, God spoke the words truth over trauma which like I said, that's what I'm calling this podcast. Um, this is where we're going with this. And as we kind of explore it, we're going to see how what we're walking through is, is important. It is. What, what happens to us is important. But what's almost more important is how we remember 
what happens to us and what we are mindful of. Okay. And mindful being like, what do we keep in our minds as the forefront of our thought? Um, think about the Israelites. This is kind of where, where, uh, God like led my mind. So he was saying like when the Israelites went through from the time, you know, Moses first went to Pharaoh and then they had their workload increased and they went through all these 10 plagues and then they were finally let go, but then they were let go only to hit a dead end with the sea. But then we know that the Red Sea parted, they were able to get through. Um, and then that was going to be their exodus into the promised land took a little longer than they originally intended. But um, essentially that was their experience. And when we read that, we read that as victory after victory after victory. We see God um, just coming through for each uh, plague. We see his protection over his people um, and his, his how he fights for them. And we also see with the parting of the Red Sea, just one of the most well-known miracles in all of the Bible. But what if, what if as an Israelite, you were walking through this and, you know, cause I, I'm saying this as like, this would probably have been me. And I feel like God is laughing, um, at this, but because it's so true, but what if being an Israelite walking through that? instead of being mindful and remembering each uh each plague or each thing as a time when god conquered you remembered the trauma of going through it like wow this was so traumatic you know all all this livestock died like yes god god preserved us and god got us through it but wow that was really traumatic because I looked all around and all the livestock was dying and I was afraid I wasn't going to have food because they were slaves. I mean, like <laughs> they were, they were dependent on this nation and a lot of the prosperity of that nation was being wiped out. Um, the plague of the firstborn. It's like, think about all the trauma people, you know, their children are dying and you know that God has protected you. And that's an amazing, miraculous thing that he has protected you. But what a different experience if you fixate on the trauma versus fixating on the truth that God has spoken over you, that it will not touch you. And then they come to the Red Sea, and the voice of trauma would say, look, God led you to a dead end. Hey, remember that feeling of panic? when you were at a dead end and your enemies were chasing you, remember that feeling of panic that God didn't save you from? But the voice of truth says, hey, remember that time that God parted the Red Sea? The voice of truth sees the triumph over the evil rather than the evil as being magnified. Just out of curiosity, because I know just from reading scripture day in and day out that remember pops up all the time. Like I was like, there's got to be a you know, crazy number. Uh, and really, there are hundreds and hundreds of references um, for the word remember. It is one of the most often used commands in the Bible. It's right up there with the do not fear. Um, and it the exact count, because I tried to get the exact count, and then I realized, oh, well, every single translation is like slightly different. So we're not going to, you know, I, I don't want to get angry emails about that's inaccurate. So there are hundreds of times, just trust me on that one. Um, but there are six different words, um, some he Hebrew, um, some Greek, there's two in Hebrew, four in Greek, that are translated remember. Okay. And so as I was looking through these words, I found a crazy wealth of just insight into remembering and its importance. So first of all, what we remember, okay, what we remember affects our present feeling, thought, and action. So like one of the first definitions I found 
in Strong's Concordance was remember, recall, call to mind, usually as affecting present feeling, thought, or action. So we usually think of memories as rather innocuous, but they affect how we're feeling. They affect how we think. They affect how we act. And so when we're hearing God, but our memories are causing us to hear this voice of trauma over the voice of truth, that's a problem because then that voice of trauma is directing our feelings and directing our thoughts and directing our actions. Another definition that I found in Strong's was to recall by memory without implying that anything was previously forgotten. Okay, so normally when we think of remember, we're remembering because we've forgotten. But there are things that we remember that we never forget. I remember my kids' birthdays. I've never forgotten my kids' birthdays. Just because I remember them doesn't mean I forgot them. And there is this... um, this thing about memory where it stays with us and there is a remembrance that we need that isn't just things that we've forgotten. We need to have a remembrance about us and carry a remembrance with us of certain things Even if you're like, oh, I I think about that all the time. I remember that. Yes, I know that. Um, You know, it's like God says, bind it to our hearts, like write it on our hands, whatever it's going to take. Remember it. Have it always before you. Another word um, I loved. So one of the words for remember biblically, one of the Greek words literally comes from the root that means to woo and win, to a spouse or to promise in marriage, to betroth. Like you are married to what you remember and that can preach. And if you're married like me, you know that it's like that person's habits affect you, their choices affect you, their daily schedule affects you. There's nothing about your spouse that you're not impacted by. Therefore, if our memories are like this, We are married to our memories. Okay. And that doesn't have to be a death sentence. Some of you are like, oh, I don't want to be married to my memories. I just want to forget them. But the purpose of this week and what God wants to do in your life is he wants to make your memories preach truth to you. No matter how broken, no matter how hard, no matter how traumatic, God wants to speak truth into that area, even if it's an area that he didn't cause, because oftentimes these traumas are not caused by God. He wants to speak to that place so that your memory of that is now touched by truth and you are married to that truth instead of married to that trauma. I also found in looking it up that there are two different types of remembering that the, that the Bible talks about. One of them um, comes from two words. One means under and one means remember. So it means to remember because you're prompted. So like, it's like a remembering under, like a, like it's, it's under the surface, but you're prompted to remember it. Um, like something, someone reminds you. And so there are those things that don't feel natural to remind ourselves of those truths that God has spoken over us or those truths that we know about God's character that don't seem to match with our experience, that don't feel natural, that don't feel second nature, that we need to dig up under and remind ourselves of. We need to prompt ourselves of those truths again. Specifically, this kind of remembering is an active remembrance. And it's very intentional. Um, Literally, Strong said, it's not offhandedly or merely incidental. The level of personal involvement and personal interest motivating this remembering accounts for why it is always active in the Greek. So there it, it's something that we are involved in. These memories are not just the ones that kind of like are 
like we talked about the, the second kind that are kind of always underlying, always there, always in our, um, kind of remembrance. But these are the kind that we really have to dig and intentionally remind ourselves, God did that. God spoke that God is this way. And so when it comes to healing those places where we've internalized trauma instead of truth, the Bible tells us everything that we need to remember. You may be like, I don't know what I need to remember, what I need to forget. You know, what, where is that line? I'll tell you what. So biblically, the things that we're supposed to remember, we're supposed to remember God's covenants to us. We're supposed to remember God's commands to us. We're supposed to remember God's miracles. We're supposed to remember his favor. And we're supposed to remember his justness, that nothing escapes him. We're supposed to remember the words that he's spoken specifically to us. Those rhema words, not just the ones that are in scripture, the ones specifically for us. We need to remember his mercy. We're told to remember specific people in the Bible. I mean, God God left that for us so that we would remember, hey, I remember there was that person who walked through that and God spoke this to them. And we're also supposed to remember the bonds of others. And by bonds, it means like, you know, um, specifically it was Paul saying about uh, the suffering, um, the things that others are going through, not because God wants us to be preoccupied with the suffering of others or to be comparing our situation to theirs or anything like that, but because there is this lie that the enemy loves to plant, that you are the only one. You're the only one that is struggling with that kind of trauma. You are the only one that has ever struggled with that. But when we remember to consider the bonds of others, we know that literally nothing has come against us that is new. The enemy is not creative. Nothing's come against us that's new. And so many people have overcome the exact thing that you're struggling with now. And that gives us hope because it's testimony. It's testimony of what God's done, which is prophecy of what he wants to do more of. Okay, and what do we forget? We forget, it tells us, forget former iniquities. Forget your past sins. Forget those things that tell you you don't measure up or you're not good enough. It also says to forget misery. You know, we're not made to remember and replay and relive those things that make us miserable. Now, it doesn't mean bury those feelings or pretend those things never happened. But what it does mean is we get to trade our mourning for joy. We get to trade our ashes for beauty. We get to trade and say, God, This thing, this memory is misery. What do you have to trade me for it? And so this week, as you sit with God, I want you to kind of take a personal inventory of places in your past where you've felt disappointed. And this may be kind of a hard, (laughs) a hard assignment. Um, I encourage you to choose somebody who knows and loves the Lord and is spirit led um, to kind of be a sounding board. You know, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's a um, trusted friend or a counselor, but um, you know, make out a list of these places where you've been disappointed. And then one by one for each of them, I want you to ask God, what are you speaking over this disappointment? What truth am I not seeing? Because if you're just seeing the trauma, you're missing the truth. 
And I want you to see what God would trade for each of those places that are just steeped in misery and stuck in that place of in between. Because like the Israelites, you know, when we access those memories, it doesn't deny the scariness of what happened. It doesn't deny um, the hardness of what happened. It doesn't deny the pain or the emotions or anything that happened in that time. But what it does say is that that is over and it is not allowed to speak into your present and inform your thoughts and your actions. Instead, we are finishing it with that truth that God has spoken over that situation so that when we move forward, what's guiding our actions and our thoughts is that truth that God has bloomed over that hopeless situation, that truth that he has spoken to you. Maybe that truth is that he's not done with that situation yet, and he's still uh, working on a redemptive scenario. Maybe that truth um, is something that you get to just by asking Jesus, where were you in this? Where were you? What did you feel for me in this? How are you using what the enemy sent for evil for good? All of these are great questions to ask the Lord. And you can even go deeper and just kind of freestyle. But God really put it on my heart that as we just kind of lay our hearts bare before him and um, get out all those roots of disappointment and of um, trauma and of things that stunt our spiritual identity and our spiritual growth, because what they do is they keep us um, bound up in in that fear or in that um, emotional state of paralysis so that we're not focused on taking that next leap, or we're too afraid to make that next step, or we're too beat down. And so take time with the Lord and sit with those things this week, not in a way that is hopeless and that is reliving these horrible things, um, but in a way that is able to see anew these times of disappointment through the lens of hope, because God has unlimited hope for your situation, not because he empathizes with you, but because he has compassion for you. And that compassion is moving him to act on your behalf. So we'll continue diving in next week. Um, but we're going to start here. And as we continue to kind of, uh, open ourselves up for what God wants to do because it's not about striving or earning or figuring it out on our own. God knows we can't do that. He's, he's doing it with us and through us. Um, as we kind of just surrender to that process, God is using it to awaken these new pieces of your identity, to remind you of who you are, to remind you of what you're called to and to launch you into that fully furnished, fully abundant living out of what God made you to do in 2023. So thanks for spending this time with me and um, just being in the process. I know that's hard. It's an uncomfortable place to sit, Um, but I can't wait to see what God does through this process. And we'll talk about more about what that looks like next week. Thanks for spending time with me today. If God spoke to you through this time, visit arrowsofzion.com for writings, resources, and ways to partner with me in reaching the unreached with the gospel. You can also find Arrows of Zion on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Have a blessed day, and let's meet here next week.